Welcome to the live stream. Today, we're going to be answering questions about government jobs, the federal hiring process, usajobs.gov, and pretty much basically anything revolving around government jobs. Hopefully, the answers will help you move closer to getting a government job. So I'm going to be answering some questions that were previously submitted. And then after that, I'll look in the chat and I'll answer any questions that we might have there. Starting first from Kenny F2073.5, who asked, when will the SSR pay scale take effect or will it be pushed off for the next year for most agencies? So SSR is the special salary rate, and this is focused towards the 2210 job series. And there's also a couple of other computer job series that it's focused on. They're going to see a pay bump between 5, 10, 15 percent, something like that. Now, the Veteran Affairs, they already implemented SSR. They did that in July. I believe it was July 16th. So a lot of those workers, they're already experiencing that pay raise. The rest of the government is still remains a little bit unclear. Now, with DOD, the Department of Defense, they came out and said they're not going to implement it. Instead of implementing SSR, they're instead doing something called accepted cyber service. Now, what this is, what this is, is the cybersecurity professional, their pay is going to be tied to that locality area. So if they're in a smaller area, they're not going to be getting paid the same as if they were in a larger area. And a lot of people are concerned about this because DOD is 25% short of cybersecurity professionals. So as for the rest of the agencies, my guess would be probably next year in 2024, they're going to be having those conversations. I know a lot of people would like to see this adopted in throughout the entire government, but we're going to have to wait and see how that goes. Next question is from Marge Poo 17 who asked, does the government offer some sort of tuition reimbursement or pay for certifications while employed directly related to the position? So yes, they do offer this. A lot of agencies, including all 15 of the executive agencies, they offer student loan repayment assistance. There's a program for that. And the way that usually works is they'll pay up to $10,000 on your student loans every year, up to six years. So up to $60,000, they'll pay back on your student loans. Now, this isn't for every position. You're going to have to read the job announcement and see if, if your job, if the job that you're applying for even qualifies for this. I know a lot of the jobs that are on the urgent hire list, if you go to usajobs.gov and you look through that list, a lot of those jobs, they have this incentive added into it. So um, looking at 2210s, once again, 1102s, if you're looking for the contracting jobs, they might have it. So you have to read through that. Now, even if your agency doesn't offer this, there's something called the public service loan forgiveness. And what this is, is if you have 10 years of government service, then you're eligible for this program to have your student loan forgiven. But the caveat is you, you had to have made 120 payments on your student loans. So this doesn't necessarily need to be government service with, within the federal government. But if you worked at a local government, uh, maybe you were a teacher or a police officer, you could qualify for this program. So I would research that. Now, when, when it comes to training a federal employee, what is your budget for training? That's agency dependent. And what I've seen largely is between about three to $5,000 a year per employee. You can use that money to pursue certifications or college classes, things like that, as long as it's re relevant to your job position. So if you are in a budget analyst position, then you can take a certification for maybe data analytics, maybe some sort of finance certification, but you need your supervisor's approval. And if you do not use the money within that fiscal year, then it would be rolled over to the next year. So they, they do have that also. Next question is from Exotic Geeks 3936, who asked, if an agency is only hiring internally, the Veteran Affairs, or if it's willing to accept internal applicants, then why is there no job progression program in the agency? So there are a lot of GS positions on usajobs.gov that have no promotion potential whatsoever. And what a lot of people do is after a year or two, you have to go apply again outside of the agency or even inside. Usually they start inside because they have an advantage with the internal hire, but they also look outside. You essentially have to decide when you're ready for a promotion and you have to make active effort to get promoted. Now, I would say probably maybe 5% of the time, what will happen is you do such a great job that management in your agency, they might create a position for you to get promoted so they can keep you, but that doesn't always happen. 
Um, so yeah, if you're stuck in a GS grade position with no promotion potential, you have to start applying. You definitely have to start applying. Now, a lot of these positions, it's, it's not up to the hiring manager on if it's a ladder or not. It's really up to the budget. So they might only get approved for a GS-11. So you'll never see GS-12 unless you start applying. All right. Another thing I want to address really quick is that a lot of people understand that in order to be successful in finding a government job, you have to have a strong resume and you have to apply multiple times. But another thing that I think is being discounted a little bit is that people are not really attending virtual hiring events so that they can meet human resource specialists, so that they can meet hiring managers. And in some of these interactions, you can pass your resume directly, especially if it's a direct hire type of announcement. On USA Jobs like Up, if you scroll all the way down, there is a section for hiring fairs or hiring information sessions. Now, what I've been doing recently is I take that information and also I go to the executive agencies like Department of Labor, Department of Defense, and they have hiring events that are listed on their webpage and they do not report it to USA Jobs like Up. So I take several of those and I email them out to people. If you want me to email it to you, there's a, the first link down below is the newsletter. It's completely free. You sign up for that newsletter and once a month, sometimes twice a month, I'll send you that information. So check that out if you're interested. Let's look at the chat and see if we have anything on the chat. All right, all right. Good morning, Mike's Tube Views 997. And he asks, do federal jobs offer tuition assistance if you got back for a master's? So I kind of touched on that earlier. There is, if you already pay tuition and you have student loans for your master's, certain job series and certain agencies, they'll pay back up to 10,000 a year. And if not, then if you have previous government service, you can look at trying to hit that 10 year mark with 120 payments and they'll have that forgiven. Let's see, next question from Mike's Tube Views 997. If you're going into IT cyber, does the pension make up for the lower salary you would get compared to the private sector? You know, Mike, this is going to depend. Um, my first, my first reaction would be, where are you working? Where are you comparing cybersecurity? If you're in Silicon Valley, or if you're in working for one of the top tech companies, a cybersecurity salary can be, you know, two, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars on the high end, maybe, right? And then you can have stock equity. So that's that's a very lucrative, compelling offer. At the same time. Um, with the government, if you're looking at pensions, it depends on how long are you staying in the government. A five-year pension looks completely different than a 20-year pension that looks completely different than a 30-year pension. I would say on the low end, a five-year pension, if you're in the D.C. area and you're looking at GS-14, something like that, five years, you're only going to be making six or 700 a month. But if you do 20, 30 years, I mean, you could be making probably 3,000 or even more. It, it just depends on your numbers. So is 3000 let's say on the high end 3 to 4000 a month which is about what 40 to 50000 a year is that going to be enticing enough for you to give up you know a much higher salary that's a personal decision that you're going to have to make a lot of people value the security where they're not worried about getting fired on a month to month basis or I'm good this quarter but next quarter who knows or this year is great, but maybe, you know, next year won't be. And you, you don't really have those same concerns when you're in the public sector working for the federal government. All right. I hope that helped. Good morning, God's favor. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning, KK. All right. Question from God's favor. Can a person qualify for a position with education only with little to no experience? Yes, you can qualify with education only, but what you will see is an individual, let's say you're qualifying on a bachelor's degree and that's all you have. That could make you eligible for the job, but another person that has a bachelor's degree just like you, and maybe they have two or three years of experience, they would more than likely uh, be found higher qualified than you. So usually with the government, you have buckets. You'll have not qualified, qualified, then you'll have highly qualified and best qualified. And what we're all trying to do is end up in that last bucket, the best qualified bucket. Now, sometimes if a lot of people are not applying for the job, they'll refer people in the highly qualified and then they'll do both, right? So they'll do two buckets. They'll do best qualified and highly qualified. It just depends on how many people are applying for the position. But I think a lot of people, 
they do have experience. They have either if it's volunteer experience, is if it's paid experience, those experiences are viewed equally. It really matters on what you're doing. So I would encourage anybody who's looking for a federal government job who wants to be competitive. And if you don't, if you do not have a paid job or you haven't had a paid job recently, I would double down on volunteering with your community, with your schools, with your churches, with your local government. I would volunteer and start using the skills. So if you're trying to apply for, or you want to be competitive for an uh, analysis, a program analyst position, I would volunteer in a position where you're analyzing. You know, you're analyzing spreadsheets for the, for the, for the um, let's say, fundraiser, right? The church fundraiser. You're looking at the numbers and you're identifying who paid what and you're adding those numbers up. That's something that you can do that probably wouldn't take a lot of your time, but it's still experience that you can put down on, on your resume. Um, okay. Let's say next question. Noah Noel, can an applicant reach out to the hiring manager after an interview? And if so, how often? Generally speaking, no, you do not reach out to the hiring manager. What happens is once the hiring manager has made a selection, they communicate that directly to the human resource office. Human resource office then does the, the background, no, not the background, the, the reference check. So they'll do a reference check and they have their own process before they extend you the tentative job offer. So it's really the ball is in the court of HR and your your hiring manager is not going to have much to do with that. At times, the hiring manager can apply a little bit of pressure to HR. This, once again, depends if you do you have a previous relationship with the with the hiring manager or is this person, you know, pretty much a stranger to you? So <laughs> if you don't know the hiring manager, I, I wouldn't keep reaching out to them and asking them. What you need to ask is you need to ask human resources, may I please have a status on, on my job application? Or can I have a status on where we're at in the hiring process? Or have you has a decision been made for the candidate of this job announcement? Something like that. Word it like that. All right. Next question. Ricardo. Good morning. Good morning, Ricardo. I'm a 54 year old attorney with 21, 21 years of experience. I have applied to dozens of positions, but I have not heard back. Am I too old for the federal government? No, Ricardo, you're not too old. There's people being hired in their 60s. I was in when I was in the veteran affairs, we hired somebody in their early 70s. You're not too old. But what you need to do, you need to make sure that your resume is, is as strong as you can get it. OGC, which is the Office of General Counsel, OGC has virtual hiring events. What I would do in your situation, you want to attend these hiring information sessions when it comes to attorneys. So what you can do to start off with, you can go to Google and type in OGC in the agency that interests you, and they have their own webpage. And a lot of times they will have virtual hiring events that you can sign up for. I know this because I just talked to an attorney a few weeks ago, and we went through and we looked at some of these events that he could sign up for. So I would start there. Start with a resume. Look at your resume. Look at your resume. Make sure it's really strong. Look at some of the hiring information sessions that you can attend. And if possible, look on LinkedIn and find other attorneys that you can reach out to that are currently working in the government and try to do an informational interview and see if you can send them your resume so that they can review it and give you some feedback on it because that's really what's going to get you in. But you're not too old. All right. Next question, Mr. Z. Going to retire July 2024 from the NYPD, 14 years. I'm interested in CBP, which is Border Patrol. When should I start the process? I make 130K, which GS should I request? Also disabled vet, 30%. Okay, this depends. I mean, you're retiring from the NYPD, so I'm assuming you're in the New York area. To make 130,000 off the top of my head, I would say probably GS13. I would say GS13, maybe step two, step three, something like that. So I would aim at GS13. I would even include GS12 because you can negotiate step levels. So maybe get into as a GS12, step eight, step nine, try to negotiate that step level as high as you can, preferably a GS13. Um, when should you start the process? You're going to retire July of next year. I would start the process, I would say, you know, at a minimum four months. So the, the average time to get a federal government job is between four and six months. So if you're talking about July, I don't know, I would say maybe uh, March, maybe around March timeframe. 
it also depends. Are you trying to take a break? Do you want to, you know, a couple of months off or a few weeks off? Or when are you eligible to actually work? I'm assuming you're eligible in July. So uh, the disabled veteran, that's going to help you out quite a bit. And there's also, if you go to feds higher, um, if you go to fedshiervets.gov, you can click on the agency directory and you can actually email uh, veteran coordinators your your DD-214, your resume, your SF-15, and your VA letter. That's going to help you out too. So yeah, it's good that you're thinking about this stuff early. All right. Let's see. We have anything else? I think. Yeah, here we go. Another question from Masonic247. Can you ask for a status update from Human Resources if you were referred to the hiring manager but not yet interviewed? No, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I would not be asking for status updates until after the interview process. But if you want to, you can look all the way down to the job announcement. There's a point of contact. You can email them. But I'm telling you, these individuals are inundated with hiring actions. So one human resource specialist does not just deal with one job announcement. They could be dealing with a dozen job announcements, each job announcement, a hundred people. So we're easily talking about over a thousand people. A lot of them email. <laughs> so you're probably going to get a canned response, a copy and paste response. If you're lucky, you might not even get any response. So I would wait for the interview. Good morning, LMAC. Then we have Farrar. Is there a September surge for hiring in the federal government? Usually, I, I tend not to want to use the word surge, but after the budget has been approved, so I would say in October, you would see, you would uh, once budgets have been authorized, a lot of times you will see more job announcements being posted. Now, this isn't an exact science, but your hiring process can be uh, jeopardized towards the end of September. If an agency realizes it's not able to get the required amount of money, then they're not going to pull the trigger on giving you your final job offer. So I would look in October. I would look now. Look now and look in October. Just keep looking, keep applying. That's the main takeaway. Okay, God's favor. Once notified, I've been referred to the hiring manager. Is there anything else I can do to stand out from other applicants? I.e. follow up letter to HR contact. There is not really anything else that you can do. You submit the application. If you're referred, that's fine. But your energy and time is better spent on applying for more job announcements that are relevant to your qualifications and experience. So at, the refer, you know, should put a smile on your face. You should nod and acknowledge it like, hey, great. <laughs> you know, my resume is working. At least that's an indicator that your resume is working. But do not get too attached to that. Do not email. I would. I would not email HR or the or uh, anybody in that agency. I would just wait until the interview request comes in and then take action. All right. Uh, next question, Tiger Lily seventy seven. Good morning. Good morning, Tiger Lily. Question: I currently work in the accepted service as an administrative assistant for fourteen years. What is the best way to move on from that position? I no longer want to be an administrative assistant. From your, from your question, I'm assuming that you might be in the 0303 job series, maybe 0301. And what I would look at, I don't know what GS grade you're in, but your administrative assistant, yeah, that could be a wide range of different GS grades. I would take some of your skills that you currently have and look at other job series that would qualify you, right? So more often than not, people are eligible for multiple job series. You do not just to have you do not have to stay in just one. So if you're in the 0303, look at some of the other skills that you have been using. And then maybe you could do something like 0343 if that interests you. If you have some, you know, if you were doing administrative for a human resource office, maybe you can look at 02 or 020, uh, 0203, I believe, or 202. You could do something like that. Um, but there, there are a lot of different opportunities there. You just have to do kind of like a crosswalk and look at where your skills and abilities line up with a different job series. But if you're talking about 0303, which I believe that you are, then understand that a zero, just because a 0303 in your current position, you have certain tasks and duties. But if you go to a different agency or a different office, that your task and duties could completely shift. Like 
for example, a zero three of a zero three four three in the Department of Justice could be significantly different than a zero three four three at the Department of Agriculture. You could be doing something completely different. So I'm not sure where your desires lie for what you want to do next in your career, but I mean, I would start there. Let's see. Next question. Change Your Socks by Veteran Paul Anderson. Hey, thanks for joining me again. The hiring manager said ex expect an offer letter, tentative job offer in the next week or two. I need help negotiating state step level. I know the basics for reasons, but are there any email templates? Yeah, I have an email template. If you if you look on the description of this video, there are some there are some templates. There's a link in there. I think it's the second link. Click on that link. There's a bunch of templates. There's one for uh, a template for a memo on how to negotiate salary. There's also a whole bunch of email templates. So check that out. That should be able to help you. All right. Let's let's go back to the previously submitted questions. Next question is from Hooday24, who asks, I had a background check done with a government agency at the beginning of this year that required a security clearance. Everything cleared, I got at the official, oh, I arrived at the official job offer letter. I accepted it, but due to some unfortunate circumstances, I had to decline the offer. So my question is, even though I didn't take the job, do I still have that clearance? Okay, so I don't know what agency this is. If you're in DOD, Anybody, anybody in DOD with JPass access, they can tell if you have an active clearance or not. I know this because I used to have JPass access, and you can just type in any anybody's social, and you can tell if they have a clearance. But nowadays, the way the SS the SF eighty six is done, there's like a dashboard. So once you complete it, there should be an indicator on that dashboard whether or not you're complete, you're approved. It should give you a status update on what's going on with your clearance. In your situation, it looks like the clearance went through. So I would say you have two years. And then after that, another clearance would have to be done. But if, you, if you're actually mark, if you're concerned about marking boxes, whether you have a clearance or not, I would mark yes. And keep in mind that if you go to another agency, you're going to have to do the whole process over again, which is frustrating. But if you go from, let's say, the Department of Defense to the Department of Homeland Security, or you go from the, say you were in the Navy or the Army, and then you go to the Department of Homeland Security, they're going to want to do your, your clearance all over again, which is mind boggling. But yeah, that's what happens. All right, next question. Recover L. If they hire me, if they hire me at the highest grade available, does that mean there's not much growth for me other than the 10 steps within that grade? Yes, that's exactly what it means. So the way the steps work is for the first four steps, it takes 12 months. So from step one to two is 12 months. Two to three is 12 months. And three to four is 12 months. After that, it takes two years. And then after that, it takes three years. So most people, they're, they probably will not wait until after step four because it takes a lot longer to see a salary increase. And step four is... is three years. So after three years in the position, you should really be looking at trying to get a promotion, trying to start applying for those uh, other agencies or other positions within your agency, I would say. So yeah, I wouldn't, if you're looking for a salary increase, I wouldn't stick around past that three-year mark. Next question, we will serve Jehovah who asks, what should I do when there is only one listed remote job in my field? I sent a message to the CMS recruiter and they indicated that they received an overwhelming number of applicants and thousands of nurses applied. Okay, so I'm guessing you're in the 0600 series, which is the healthcare field. That can be kind of rough, but like I was discussing earlier, you need to open yourself up to maybe looking at other job series. Uh, I know that you're doing nursing, or I think that you're doing nursing, but with nursing comes other skills. It comes with reviewing charts, inputting data into databases. Maybe you've taught other individuals on how to do certain skills, maybe some um, nursing assistance. You've taught that, so you have that training skill that you can also leverage. So uh, I would look there. I know that if you're if you're committed to one job series and remote work does not come up often, when it does come up, they, it will receive thousands of applicants. So keep that in mind. Let's look at the chat. Let's see. Uh, God's favor. 
Do you know why remote jobs are area focused more so now? I've been seeing remote jobs in specific areas versus anywhere in the U.S. Yeah, I noticed that also. I don't know what the split is. I don't think it's 50-50. I still think I still think that the majority of remote jobs, they do have that flexibility with being anywhere in the United States, but there are some that want you within a commuting distance. And the only reason that I could think is they want that option to have you come into the office to do some sort of function. Not that you're going to be working in the office, but they want they want the possibility of you being able to walk into the office for probably an administrative type function. But I have noticed that and it's kind of it's kind of frustrating. All right, let's see. Next question. CE user, can you apply to a higher GS level than where you are at, where you are currently at? Yeah, you can. So let's say if you're a GS, let's for example, let's say GS 11 and you want to apply to a higher, higher GS grade. Well, everyone or most people should know that after 12 months time in grade, you're eligible for the next grade. So you're eligible for GS 12. But let's say you have previous experience. So if you're in a GS 11 position for a however long and you want a GS 13 or a GS 14, you will be relying on your previous experience. So if you were in the military for 20 years, you can use that experience in order to attain a higher GS grade. Outside of that, you're going to be bounded by time and grade rules. Where you're not bounded, excuse me, where you are not bounded by time and grade rules is open to the public. And also, if you uh, attain a job using Schedule A, 30% disability, or VRA, you're not going to be bounded. But if you use VEOA, you will be bounded by time and grade rules. Uh, competitive service, obviously, you're going to be bounded by time and grade rules. But yeah, you can do that. There's a little nuance to it, but you can do it. All right, let's see. Uh, another question. Blind. Good morning, blind. I'm currently working in cellular sales with no degree. Would a 2210 step five with IRS be a good stepping stone um, into the GS world? Oh, wait, you mean 2210 GS5? Would a GS5 be a good stepping stone? How long have you been working in sales? You say you're working in sales. So what's going to tell me if it's a good stepping stone or not is how many years of experience do you have? Because if you come back and tell me you have 25 years of experience, you don't really have any business applying to a GS5. You should be aiming a lot higher than that. But um, let's say, you know, I don't know, GS5, that's kind of low. It depends on your situation. Do you have family members? Do you have people that depend upon you? Are you in a high cost living area? You know, all these things you're going to have to take into consideration. I know for most people, if I'm if I'm looking at GS5, I'm, I'm looking at a kid that just came out of high school and maybe he did a year or two at community college and he's trying to get into the government. Then I'm like, okay, yeah, that fits you. But other, other than that, 2210, that's a valuable skill set. So I would need a lot more context. Um. Next question. CE user, how do you get a higher security clearance? Is it tied to the job where you'll be working? Yeah, absolutely. So the security clearances, they it's only if the position needs it. And it's incumbent of the government to give you that security clearance. So you don't have to pay anything extra. You don't have to raise your hand. If you apply to a job announcement that requires a security clearance, they will put you through that process. Before you get the final job offer, you will go through that process. And, and the paperwork for that is changing. I think next year. So it will not be the SF-85 or the SF-86 anymore. It comes down to one form called, I think, the VQM. I might have that wrong. I have a video coming out about that, though. The, the security process paperwork is changing somewhat. Next question. Kendell, good morning. 5.2% still the anticipated pay raise for 2024. Yep. As of right now, as of this morning, that is still the anticipated rate. So hopefully that goes through. Oh, wow. I got to catch up on a few more questions. Okay. Charles, good morning, Charles. How like, likely can you get a position if you have experience doing the job, but not on the system the agency uses? Well, this is going to depend a lot on what that agency is requiring. You can still get it at times. It could be enough for you to get the interview. Then once you get the interview, you kind of sell. You sell your experience to them and how you're a quick learner and everything like that. But um, 
there are some positions like I was looking at one at the Department of Air Force where they want you to have experience with so many systems. And it, you can when you're reading it, you can tell that it's crucial for that job, for that job position to have those skills. And that type in that type of scenario is probably not likely. But in others, if they just mention it once or twice and, you know, there's five other requirements or five other desirables, then I would still apply. I would still apply in that in that situation. All right. Kendall, currently a 0644 GS11. GS12 and 13s are rare positions. What might help someone move up? Okay. So 06. Let me just take a look at that real quick. And for some reason, my browser doesn't want to work. All right, let me get back to that one. Okay, next question. Kendall, if I don't answer that, ask me again. Dogo Dango. How do some of the GS jobs justify education and experience requirements? I've seen GS5 that require a master's degree. That is crazy. Okay, how do they justify it? Usually... At some particular point, there's a desk audit done with a subject matter expert and a human resource professional, and they, they identify all the tasks that that position needs to do, and then they come up with uh, slotting it for a particular GS grade. Now, uh, oftentimes, if you're in the position and you're like, wait a minute, I'm doing way more work than a GS5, you can request a desk, uh, you can request a desk audit, and they could potentially increase the GS grade of that position, but they can also lower it, so it's a risk of doing that. Now, I have not seen many GS5 positions that require a master's degree. That, that has to be an anomaly. Um, what you will see sometimes is you'll see GS11 positions that say something like, if you want to qualify on education, you have to have a PhD. That's ridiculous. You can qualify on the majority of positions with experience. So you can get, there are people in the government that, ha, that are GS15 that I know that they have no college. They do not have a college degree. They might have some semester hours. I don't know. But they do not have a college degree. They simply have relevant experience. And that has been a focus over the last 10 years is to open up positions more towards individuals that have relevant experience than a whole bunch of degrees. So uh, read the job announcement. I can't. I'm going to have to keep my eye, on, eye out on that one because a GS5 with a master's degree, that makes no sense. Okay. Next question. Toasty face. Good morning. What other job series would I qualify for? I'm currently at 3501 WG03, currently working on my bachelor's. Yeah, I'm not sure the full depth of your experience. So it's really hard for me to identify exactly what you would be qualified for unless I had your resume right in front of me. Okay. Next question. Uh, Shawnee G, does non-paid experience, does a non-paid position count as experience to supplement when you have an employment gap? Absolutely. And this is something I've been saying a lot recently. It does count the same, right? Now, when I say the same, I mean that if you have a paid job that you're doing 40 hours a week, or if you have volunteer experience, maybe you have two volunteer, maybe you're volunteering at two different locations and that equates 40 hours a week, that would be the same. So you can use that. A lot of people use that to address employment gaps, which they're not supposed to take any kind of discriminatory action regarding employment gaps. There are people that have large employment gaps that still get job offers, but you can use your volunteer experience. Super chat. Thank you so much, Felipe. I really appreciate that. Felipe asks, I've been applying for government jobs for the past year with no bites, live in the DMV, and five years of experience with logistics and material handling. Any advice? Yes. My first advice, if you were sitting next to me, I would say, Felipe, show me your resume. Let's look at that thing. Let's figure out what's going on with that. I don't know if you're using the resume job builder or the... the the resume builder on USA Jobs. I'm not sure where you got your template. I'm not sure where's the formatting. Um, 
who told you that resume was good to go? Did you did you have success previously with that resume? So that's the first place that I would look. Second, I would say, hey, where are you focused at? What job series are you trying to get? You have logistics. So there's job series that focus on logistics. You know, there's um there's one in the 0300 series. I believe it's 0349 that focuses on logistics. I would look there. I would also probably look at the 0343. I would look there. Um, but yeah, it all comes down to making your previous experience as relevant as you can towards the position that you're applying to. And you're doing that with the resume. I also don't, I don't know what hiring paths you'd be qualified for. So that could give you an advantage as well. I would ask you, are you eligible for any uh, additional hiring paths? Um, but start with the resume. Let's say, okay. Next question, God's favor. Can you explain your method of applying for jobs at least four times a day? Yeah, so ideally, what I tell a lot of people is try to apply three or four times a day. And let's say that each time takes 15 minutes. I'm not I'm not counting the job assessment time. There might be some job assessments attached to that, but let's just look at the job announcements. Say 15 minutes, three, four times, you're looking at 45 minutes to an hour. I would do this with a, a hyper-focused resume to the job series. So you have, uh, uh, let's say you have a resume for the 0301 series, for the 0301 job series. I would take that resume and I would look and try to find positions where you do not have to alter your resume very much. What you will notice in some of these job series, when it comes to specialized experience, a lot of the same language is used, not always. Now with the 2210, that has like a dozen different disciplines. So a 2210 could be an IT specialist, it could be a help desk specialist, it could be a software uh, application developer. So that varies wildly. But there are other ones, let's say 0560, budget analyst. That one is pretty clear and cut, and you will see the same verbs in the specialized experience area. So with that, I would create a job filter. Look, now this is going to depend also on where you're located. If you're restricted to a, sm a small town or city, this might not work for you unless you're opening yourself up for remote positions. And so that's what I would do. I would have, um, you can have up to five resumes depending on you, who you are and what experience you have, that means you could target up to five job series with five um, tailored resumes towards that job series. And every day I would try to, to commit one hour to apply to three or four job announcements because volume matters a lot. It's not always, the best qualified individual does not always receive a job offer because there are times where a hiring manager is impressed with someone's experience. So let's say, let's say that five people are picked for an interview, right? Say they referred 20 or 30 people and then five people are picked from an interview. Out of those 20 or 30 people, usually like a panel or a hiring manager will look through the resumes and they're like, oh, look, this person actually worked at Booz and Allen. That's wonderful. <laughs> Maybe they have a, a subconscious bias towards Booz and Allen. Like, oh, great. I worked at Booz and Allen. You know, people are like that. Or this person has a master's degree from the University of Michigan. So there might be certain things in your resume that like speak to an individual. They're like, oh, let's put this resume over here. You know, let's let's interview this person. So that comes into effect. And then you have the, the whole thing where somebody knows somebody. That's always something that could potentially happen. So that's why I really emphasize on volume to give yourself the best shot possible. Now, what I hear to that advice, a lot of people, a lot of times people say, well, you know, those opportunities are not around. And the only thing you can do in that situation is, you know, <laughs> be willing to move or open yourself up to more job series based on your experience. All right. Let's see. All right. The next question. Noah Noel, the job announcement shows the security clearance as other. Marilyn conducted a background check with CJIS in November. Can this be used by the federal government to reduce the onboarding time? Hey, if your security clearance says other, the chances are you're, you're just going to need a background check. You're not going to need a security clearance. Probably something like a public trust or your standard background check. So if you have a previous background check done, that's probably going to help things out. But for a regular background check, it shouldn't take anything more than two weeks. I mean, you're really looking at probably five days. Um, so I wouldn't concern myself too much on that one. 
All right, next one, CE user. If someone is hired under direct hiring authority and then later on finds a job in the competitive service, are you considered an internal applicant? Yes. It, so if if someone is hired under direct hiring authority, that position is still coded. It's either competitive service or accepted service. If you're in the competitive service and you apply for another job, yes, you're going to be considered as an internal applicant. Like if you're if the direct hiring authority uh, made it possible for you to be in DOD, once you start working in DOD, you are now an internal candidate. But you're going to have to wait 12 months for time and grade in order to apply for merit promotion type job announcements. All right. Next question. I've been applying to 0201 HR management series for about six months. Anytime they pop up with no referral to the hiring manager, aside from working with the CFRs, I exceeded the qualification. Okay, that's not really a, a question, but what I would say in that situation Six months with no referrals, to me, it's clear and cut. It has to be your resume. It has to be your resume. Um, you say you applied for six months. I don't know how many times you applied, though. Are you applying every day? Are you applying a few times a week? I, I see more commonly with individuals with strong resumes, they're receiving a 50% referral rate or more. So if you apply 10 times, you should have five referred or more. If not, then go back to step one, relook the resume. All right. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the questions. Next question comes from Shadow F305, who asks, if you have a TS, a top secret SCI clearance and you go contractor, can you go back to the government without any issues? Yeah. You can always come back to the government. Come on back. Keep in mind that every agency, they want to do their clearances all over again. A lot, of, a lot of people in the 2210 job series, they get these incentives, they get on board, they work for two or three years, they receive a, a clearance, a secret clearance or a top secret clearance. And then after a few years, they leave the government because they realize that cybersecurity professionals and software developers, they are rewarded a lot more in the defense contracting company. So they'll go to contracting. And then they'll they'll earn their money there for, let's say, a decade or 15 years. And then after that, they realize, well, you know, I really I'm starting to value benefits more. I want to make sure I have a pension or I want to add to my pension. Then they come back to the government. So people come, you know, uh, in and out from federal government to contracting back and forth. Good, good news is if you do at least three years in the federal government, then you have tenure. So then it doesn't matter how long you wait, you can always apply directly to a competitive service type job. So that that is a benefit. All right, next question comes from Exotic Geeks 3936 who ask, why is it so difficult to hire civilians with no authorities compared to veterans with where everything is possible? Okay. Hey, everyone has difficulties. E it's easy if you're not a veteran, if you're not disabled, and you look at a disabled veteran, their applications are supposed to float to the top. So it looks, it's clear that they have an advantage. But there are countless amount of disabled veterans that are frustrated because they cannot get a government job. They cannot get hired. And that happens every single day. I would look at your job series because I know right now the 2210 job series, the IT specialist, there are a lot of people that I, that I talk and work with almost every day. They're getting government jobs and they're not veterans at all. And also uh, the 1102 series to a certain extent. If you do not want to worry about somebody with veteran preference bumping you off the referred, uh, the highly qualified or the well-qualified, then look at direct hiring authority because direct hiring authority does not factor in, does not consider veterans preference at all. So if you want to do it solely on your merit, apply to the direct hire authority. And you can do that by searching on usajobs.gov on the top left uh, top left corner. Just type in direct hire and click search. Okay, next question is from Angie, Angie Pendroza, 2690. Can you do a video explaining what 12-month roster versus 12-month register? I see both. Thanks. Yeah, they mean the same thing. <laughs> you look at the job announcement. Sometimes it says 12-month roster. Sometimes it says 12-month register. Sometimes it doesn't say anything at all, but you look at it and you see it's for 12 months. And then you read it and you can see they can make multiple selections off of that one announcement. 
And I tell people a lot, this is a great use of your time to apply for one of these job announcements because you can apply one time and you can be considered 12 times or even more than 12 times. So it's the best use of your time. Also, with these 12 month rosters, a lot of times they'll ask you, is it okay if we share your resume? You always want to click yes to that question. Excuse me. Like I was saying, you always want to click yes. Anytime it says, is it okay if we share your resume across multiple agencies or within our agency? Click yes. I know people who were hired off of clicking yes because your resume ends up in another office and they're like, hey, this person has the skill set we're looking for. Let's let's give that person the interview and it leads to an opportunity. All right, let's look at the chat. Thank you guys for being here with me today. Um, what is this? Okay. Oh, wait, wait, I'm skipping. Here we go. Mike's two views. Do DOD 8140 certifications really matter to help you get a job as a CISSP? It, the only time that the only time these type of cert certifications matter is if it's mentioned in the job announcement. You will see uh, under specialized experience, but above the education, there's a little section there, and it's for certifications. If you don't see any certifications in there, then it's not required. Now it could be desirable, but it's not required. If you have the relevant experience outside of that, you don't have a certification, you will still end up in the highly qualified bucket. Uh, okay, next question. Art Hughes. Good morning, Art. I received a tentative eligibility for a position, but no second notice of a referral or a non-referral is direct hire authority with a 12-month register. Yeah, that's great, Art. Like I was mentioning earlier, you could be considered, you know, next month and then also in October and then also in November. Now, you're you're tentatively eligible because you filled out the questionnaire the appropriate way. So you mark down that you have, you know, 12 months experience of, of the of the next lesser grade and you also mark down certain things that you you know you're proficient and because you mark down all of those bubbles you're eligible so the next step i don't know i don't know when when you actually received that email that you're eligible but the next step after that is either you're going to be referred or you're not going to be referred now unfortunately not everyone receives that email you can check on usa jobs sometimes but sometimes that's not updated it's incumbent on the HR office to actually update that stuff. And they don't always do it in a timely manner. So best advice to you is to keep applying for other positions that you know you're qualified for. All right, next question, Michael Bay. Good morning, Michael. I was finally referred for the job on August 18th. The job closed on July 19th, but no email yet. The announcement mentioned that they're expected to hire someone 40 days after the closing date. No chance. Um, this sounds like one of those positions that it says we're only accepting the first 25 applications or we're only accepting the first 50 applications. And that and that's why. Oh, no. Correction. August 18th. I thought you, I thought it closed the next day, but actually it closed a month later. OK, there's there's no telling. There's no telling. Uh, you're you're going to have to wait on that. But do not get too tied up on waiting and figuring out what happened to that job application. Keep applying to other job applications. All right. Um, next question, Luis Gonzalez. Hi, Armand. Hi, Luis. If I collect 100% VA disability, would I lose these benefits and payments if I get a federal government job? No, you still keep it. Now, I think what was it like 12, 15 years ago, there was, there was a law that said you if you added your disability and your salary, it couldn't exceed a certain amount. But as of right now, you can collect your disability. You can actually, if you're retired, I don't know if you're retired. Let's say you're retired after 20 years. You can, do, you can get your retirement pension. You can get your disability check. And you can draw a salary for the full amount for your GS position. You can get all three of those uh, streams of revenue, so to speak. You can have all of them. So that shouldn't be a concern. All right. Next question, Diana Davis. I've been a GS5 for the past three years. How can I skip to higher grades outside of the time and grade rules? The way you do that is you apply to open to the public positions. Or another thing you can use, you can use previous experience in order to qualify for higher GS grades. So I don't know what you did outside of these last three years, but I mean, there could be a chance that you were in another career 
Maybe you spent some time in the military. Maybe you worked for, you know, a corporation. Maybe you worked retail. I'm not sure. But you can focus in on that experience and you can qualify on that experience. But you cannot use that. Um, like if you're just applying for a competitive service job or you're trying to do a merit promotion, then you're going to be tied to a GS6. The only thing that you can get is a GS6. So looking for look for the open to the public. Look if you have any hiring pathways like Schedule A. If you're disabled, you have Schedule A. If you're a veteran, you could have VRA. You could have 30% disability. You can use that also because time and grade rules do not apply in those pathways. CE user, you just skipped my question. Let me go back up there then, CE user. Um, oh, here we go. I did skip your question. Do you get any benefit by working as a reservist in the military when you're a currently GS employee? I wouldn't say you get a benefit, but when you do your annual drills, um, that's not going to be an issue. There's a, there's a guy in my, in my past agency in the office I work in, he was a reservist. And uh, there was one time he had to go away for something like close to two months. It was like a month and a half or something like that. So they're very understanding of that. They're not going to uh, stigmatize you or, you know, look down upon you for, for doing your service with the reserves or the National Guard. I wouldn't say that there's an additional benefit uh, outside from getting your, you know, your normal reservist check. Um Next question. Is direct hiring authority not competitive? Yes, it, it can be competitive. Uh, it just, I'm guessing you're saying competitive service or do you, or are you mentioning competitive as in, I, I would need more context on that. So the direct hiring authority, it, you do not have to worry about veterans preference. So in that sense, you're not competing uh, against people that have a preference over you and using that preference to bump you off. Now, if they have more experience than you, then they're still going to be considered highly qualified and they'll still get referred. So, th I mean, it, it's all a competition uh, to a certain extent. All right, next. Uh, let's go back to the previously submitted questions. I'm curious, if you're a federal employee, if you're already in the government, can you type Fed in the chat? I just want to kind of get a, a reading on who is here. And I would appreciate that. Next question is from Joa Scott, 50, who asked, do some job assessments start off requesting your social security number? Yeah, they do. And it's really common. And I wouldn't feel weary about inputting it. I know there are a lot of people that are concerned because when they start applying for a government job on usajobs.gov, the screen flashes and you see a .com on the address bar. You don't see a .gov, so you don't think it's secure. But it is secure, and you should input it. Once you input it the first time, you should not have to worry about inputting your personal information again. It should already be saved in there. But you're going to have to give your Social Security number up if you want to be a government employee. You know, Just to do the background check or for a security clearance, you're going to end up giving your Social Security number up. All right, next question. From Chief5981, who asked, I am a GS7 step four right now with 16% COLA and will get automatically promoted to GS9 at my one year mark. What steps should I anticipate being a GS9? I'm guessing step one since I'm going from seven to nine, but I'm not sure. So in your situation, there is something called the two-step promotion rule. And I'm not I'm not entirely sure on your locality or where you're located, but what you do from GS7, where you're currently at, you look at the GS9 pay scale and you see at what point does the salary exceed your current salary and then add two steps. And that's what you should be. So you're not going to start off at step one. I don't, I don't think you would start off. It, it depends on what your salary is. Uh, if you're a GS7 step four, you shouldn't start off at GS9 step one. Uh, next question comes from Seriously Leslie. Can I accept more than one tentative job offer even if I am Schedule A? How does time and grade come into play? Yes, you can accept all the tentative job offers. The issue is when you start the first day of work. And if you accept a job offer, let's say for a GS-11, the first day of work, you now have one day time and grade as a GS-11. So if another offer comes in that's a GS-12, depending on the hiring authority used, the hiring path, that can make it so that you're ineligible to accept it. For example, 
if you accept a job offer with VEOA, meaning that you're a veteran, that that hiring path is bounded by time and grade rules. So you could not turn around the very next day and then accept a higher GS grade because you only have one day time and grade. But if you accept a job position using VEOA and then a, and then a GS-12 comes up, a higher GS grade comes up, and you're also eligible for 30% disabled, uh, 30% disabled veteran, if you're also eligible for that, then you could do it. Schedule A, you could do it with Schedule A. So it, it comes down to the hiring path or the hiring authority that they use in order to put you into that position. But there are people that are surprised when they cannot accept a higher grade because of time and grade. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. All right, let's look at the chat. Let's see how the chat's doing. Oh, we got some feds. We got some government employees here. That's great. So, all right. Let's see, Diana. So the federal experience I've acquired over the past three years cannot be used to skip grades by open to public announcements. I believe you stated that you were a GS5. So the experience that you've acquired over the last three years, that's going to be that's going to reflect on your SF50 as you were a GS5. So that would qualify you for GS6. In the, in the event that you wanted a GS-11 or a GS-12, you would have to look for other experience outside of the time where you were labeled as a GS-5. Because those three years, they fall under you being a GS-5. So you can use that experience, but you can use that experience to get a GS-6 more often than not. I'm sure there's cases where there's exceptions to the rule, but that's how I understand it. All right. Felipe, I only apply to open to the public positions that does not have any other hiring path available, but I still get emails saying by law we had to consider a veteran before you. What gives? For open to the public positions, there there is still veteran preference. I know you, you do not see the green icon that says veteran preference, but in certain circumstances, they still have to they still have to acknowledge it. So when there's a hiring cert and there's a number, like they're, if they're using numerical scores, you could be number 90. And another veteran that's disabled can be 90, but they're disabled. So they're going to float ahead of you. And if they're trying to cut that number, let's say they only want to interview four people, you could be the fifth one on that list. So you're not going to get extended the, the interview. Or in this circumstance, you're not going to be given the referral because they're only referring a certain amount. And there were so many veterans that applied to the job that you didn't meet the cutoff. The only way where you, you're not going to have to deal with veterans, with, with veteran preference, if you're not a veteran, is, is the uh, direct hiring authority. If you type in direct on USA Jobs and you run a search and if it's direct hiring authority, you don't have to worry about that. Also, there are some job series where there's not that many veterans applying. You know, out of the whole entire government, it, it, only. 25% are veterans. So we talk a lot about veteran preference and veterans, but 75% of the government have never served in the military and they're not considered a veteran. So the majority of people are getting in that are not veterans. There are certain job series that attract more veterans. And there are other job series that require different skill sets that you might not have to compete as much with veterans. But to get away from 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 veterans, uh, not to get away from veterans, to get away from veteran preference is direct hire authority. It's always going to be direct hiring authority. All right. Next question. Fasal, how many years minimum can you put in to get a pension? It's five years. After five years in the federal government, you are fully vested for a pension. Now, that amount might not be much. <laughs> so every year in addition that you do will grow your pension. The formula for pensions is years of service in government times your high three salary times 1% or 1.1%, depending on how long you have. If you have 20 years in the government, it's 1.1%, it's 1 which is essentially a 10% increase in your pension. So that's how you would figure it out. Like if you're an experienced professional coming from the private sector and you know that you can compete for a GS-14, 
in the DC area, you know, you're probably looking at 140, 150,000 a year. So if you did that job for five years, you would do the calculation. It's going to end up something close to 650 a month. Now, if you want a higher pension, you're just going to have to work more years, get a higher salary, you know, and it keeps growing. All right. Next question. I'm a veteran with three years, three plus years and no preference. Can I apply? I'm a veteran with three plus years and no preference. Can I apply for a position open to veterans? I was not referred because of the hiring path on many positions while referred and interviewed for others. So if you're a veteran, when you say you're not, you're not, uh, you don't have any preference. You're saying that this is what I believe you're saying that you don't qualify for VRA because you were never deployed and received a campaign badge. So VR, VRA is off the table for you. Also, you're not disabled. So if you're not disabled at all, then then uh, the plus 10 points, that's off the table. What is not off the table for you and everyone else who served in the military is VEOA. What VEOA allows you to do is to apply for positions that would normally only be open to government employees. So that's what that means. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go back to the questions. Next question is from Rosemary Benton 8886, who asked, I had a federal interview two weeks ago and my reference checked the same week of the interview. I reached out to the HR manager today and she told me to wait for HR. She said that HR... She said she will ask HR to speed it up. What does that mean? Why can't she tell me if I was selected or not? It's not the hiring manager's job to tell you if you were selected or not. It comes from human resources. So once a selection has been made, it typically goes to human resources. They're the ones who extend the offer. But it seems like you have some strong indicators. It seems like it's going to happen. There was a time I interviewed at the Department of Labor and the hiring manager gave me his business card and he said, listen, if you do not receive a job offer within the next week, I want you to call me. And I said, okay, <laughs> I took his card. I could tell that he eagerly wanted me to get a job offer, but it took longer than a week. A week went by nothing. Two weeks went by nothing. Even though he had expressed urgency towards the HR office, nothing happened until the third week. So that just kind of, it shows you that even though a hiring manager or a team or an office really wants you, it can still take it can take some time. So I would be patient. Everyone has their own system and processes to deal with that. All right, next question is from Stephanie Camilla, 3363. Why will the HR specialist refer applicants to the hiring manager if they're not going to call? Okay, so... Usually an HR specialist, when they're reviewing applications, they will refer a certain amount. It could be 20, 30, 40 people. It could be two or three, depending on how many people actually applied for the job. Now, the hiring manager, they don't have to select anyone to interview. It's on them if they want to pick somebody. They could say, I don't want anybody. And then, you know, let's repost the job announcement and get some more people. Or they can pick who they want to interview. Now, There's no obligation at all at the referral state. That's just an indicator that your resume was strong enough to make it to the hiring manager. But if you do not receive an interview, that's because the hiring manager didn't want to interview you for whatever reason. He didn't want to interview you. Um, It's on HR to update the system so that it reflects on usajobs.gov. And sometimes they do this and sometimes they do not. Now, like any office, they could be under an, ass- uh, an assessment or an audit. And in that case, what you might see is like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months goes by. And then all of a sudden your status is updated and you're like, I forgot about this job completely. But they're just trying to close the loop and finish off what, the- what they should have done earlier. Next question is from Norwood, too, who asks, could you do a video that contains some information for infantry? I've looked at physical security and police officer jobs. Are there any others that you would suggest? Yes. So I have a video coming out really soon about veterans. And if you're in the infantry, what I would ask you 
is what other experience do you have? I understand that you know how to do road marches. You know how to do infantry tactics. You know how to carry heavy weapons and carry a heavy rucksack. But did you work in operations? Did you spend any time in S3? Because if you did, then you could qualify for an administrative type job. You can qualify for a 0303, maybe a 0301. Did you train soldiers? Now, if you're a non-commissioned officer, if you're a commissioned officer, the, the answer is probably yes, you trained them some kind of way. You either use butcher block paper, you use PowerPoint, you took a stick in the sand and you drew different routes. If you train people, if you have experience in training, then look at the 1700 series because there's a lot of training jobs. It's not just for teachers with license. It's for a lot of people. It's curriculum development. It's instructors. Look at that. Maybe you worked in logistics. You helped out in S4. If you helped out with logistics, look at 0346. That covers logistics. Um, you know, everyone in infantry is going to have their own experience. And this goes for any combat occupation, not just infantry, maybe artillery, maybe combat engineer. You have to look at your experience and see what can you leverage to get a better job. All right, let's look at the let's look at the chat. Thank you. And we're already over an hour. Let's see. CE user, what can the federal government offer since we do not have state disability benefit to get paid, for example, on maternity, paternity? So, so the federal government, when it comes to paternity leave, they have 12 weeks. 12, 12 weeks paid, if I'm not mistaken. And that's three months. And for maternity, it's a little bit longer than that. So they do have that. Um, now, you know, they have different benefits depending on your situation. All right, let's see. Next question, Jose. If you get hired for a term appointment position two years, not more than four years, when is the soonest you can apply for a permanent competitive position? If you're on a term position, I would just start applying. I mean, after 12 months, you know, you, you meet your time and grade, start applying for the next GS grade especially if you know that the job is at jeopardy, you know, from two to four years, I would start applying immediately. Uh, thank you. Next question. I'm a GS9 applying for a GS11 position that requires my annual appraisal to be uploaded, but I didn't have it available to upload at the time. Can I still upload it to USA Jobs if the announcement is closed? I would try, but I, my first instinct is probably you cannot do that. What you can do, if you would like, so that you're not, you can be disqualified if you do not attach required documents to your job application. So what I would try to do is reach out to the person at the bottom of the job announcement, that point of contact, email them your appraisal and let them know. In the future, if you do not have a required document, you should have a reason why. So something as simple as a Microsoft Word document and then typing in, I do not have my current appraisal that's why I attached my old appraisal or um, an explanation, a justification on why you were not able to attach the required document. In your, in your case, I'm hoping you put your previous appraisal and then uh, and sometimes on the job announcement, there is also a block of text where you can add further context that can help your situation out. Next question. How do you get a job? Uh, CE user, how do you get a job at an embassy? What education and experience will you need to be a diplomat? So that is the, um, the State Department, the Department of State. The State Department, there, there are like programs that are there. You know, it's kind of like almost, I would say something like, if you're trying to get in the FBI, there's an FBI Academy. If you're trying to get the CIA, there's a CIA Academy. There is somewhat of a program or academy where they put you through in order to get that type of position. And you can apply, just filter through Department of State on usajobs.gov and look, and you can start the process of trying to be there. Um, for the diplomats or the ambassadors, those come from the Department of State too. And I believe they're somewhat equivalent to a higher level SES. But good question. All right, let's 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 do a couple of more. Next question is from Daniel Wobbleski, 638. Can you do a video for those of us that have government jobs, but they're, we're struggling to get to that GS11 level. GS level. Yeah, that could be a good idea. The mo the reason I would say most people struggle to get to GS11 or higher, it's it's one or two reasons. The first one is your job series. Um, that could limit your upside depending on what job series you're, you're in or which one you're pursuing. 
because there are job series that have more room at the top. And the next thing is your location because the smaller towns, they have less opportunities. They simply have less opportunities. So if it's not one of those two issues, the other thing I would mention is your resume. Look at your resume again. It has to be strong, has to be relevant. Next question is from Mob0585 who asks, are there a lot of contractor roles if you want to be located in the DC area? Yeah, absolutely. In the DC area, I would say there's probably over a hundred contracting companies. And there's a lot of opportunities that people, uh, for people, especially if you wanna go back and forth, like I mentioned earlier, you could be working, when I was working at the Department of Veteran Affairs, I would receive messages from recruiters saying, hey, we have a contract supporting the VA and you have VA experience. We would love for you to join the team because contractors are supporting federal agencies. So they're looking for people that can speak that same language, that know the acronyms, that know the work culture. So um, in that case, people, there's like a lot of uh, cross-pollinating, so to speak. A lot of people going from, from each side. All right. Uh, next question is from Tiger Lily 777 who asks, what certification would be best to help move up from an administrative assistant position? Certification? I'm not a big fan of, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of certifications unless it's required. For an administrative job, if you if you want to take a certification, I would do it on a skill set that's needed for your position. So look at Microsoft Excel, maybe a certificate in SharePoint. Government uses SharePoint a lot. Maybe Salesforce could be PowerPoint, Word, Microsoft Office. Look at a certificate where it's going to, um, whatever skills are required, it's going to kind of emphasize those skills that you have those skills. And that could be helpful. But I really think number one is going to come down to experience. Excuse me. All right. Let's look at the chat really quick. Tyler Simmons is a six page resume too long. In my opinion, no. But also be mindful, be aware. There are some job announcements that say we will not read any page past page five. And in that case, they're only going to look at the first five pages. But if it doesn't say that language, if it doesn't specifically mention a page number, then they're going to look at the whole thing. I think six six pages is fine. Uh, I really don't think most people should be going back more than 10 years. Uh, and that's just basically because of relevant experience. You know, 10 years ago, different technology, different systems. So, and it kind of, it can kind of date you in a sense. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, Rosie Stroop asks, can you apply veteran preference more than once for jobs open to the public and internal agency jobs? Yeah, you can use veteran preference as much as you like. You know, um, now when we're talking about veteran preference, we already mentioned multiple times that it doesn't apply with direct hiring authority. It also doesn't apply for internal agency actions. So when it comes to merit promotions or transfers, they're not going to consider veteran preference on those actions. So keep that in mind too. Okay, next question is from Oscar Garcia, 8573, who asked, does USA Jobs have jobs for communication majors, communication majors, entry-level jobs? Okay, so if you're a communication major, I would um, first probably look at 1001. 1001 is general arts and information. And what you'll see there, a lot of those job announcements will be titled communication specialist. So look there. Also look at 0391, that's telecommunications. And then 0301 or 0303, that's probably where you're going to see the most recent student pathway or student internship opportunities. You're going to see it in the 0300 series. But look at all three of them or four of them. All right. Next question comes from Jolly Poet. Can you, can you accept more than one tentative job offer from the same agency, different locations? Yeah, the location doesn't really matter. Even if it was at the same location, you can accept more than one tentative job offer. I don't think people really have an idea on how big these federal agencies actually are. You know, look at the Veteran Affairs, hundreds of thousands of employees. You have so many different offices. You have the, you have the Chief Information Office or the Office of Information Technology. You have the, uh, you know, OGC, the Office of General Counsel. You have so many different offices 
a lot of times they're kind of, they somewhat exist in a silo where they're not communicating a lot with the other ones. And there are thousands of people applying every day, except when you have tens of job, job offers come in, accept as many as you can, is, is what I would say to you. Let's look, see if we got anything in the chat. Do you like trains? That's an interesting question. Do you like trains? I do like trains. <laughs> I actually took a train from here to Philadelphia, the Amtrak, and I took a train from here to New York City. Uh, and here means DC, from DC to New York City. And it was a pretty good experience. I do like trains. Thank you for asking. All right. Um, all right, we're already kind of running late on time. I want to let you guys know, I really appreciate everyone coming in today. And if you need further assistance, if you need help with the federal hiring process, getting a government job, look down below into the links. There's the newsletter, the free newsletter I spoke about. That could benefit you greatly if you're interested in attending virtual hiring events. Also, there's digital products like the, the templates, like the resume examples, like the salary negotiation. All of that stuff is down below. And there's also a course if you need more kind of direct one-on-one -on -one assistance. That's where I'll help and edit uh, a federal resume. And we kind of go through it in order to get it at a really competitive level. You can check that out below also. Um, I'm working on a few videos later today. One coming out tomorrow is going to be focused more on retirement. I've been seeing more and more retirement questions about FERS, about the TSP. So uh, I want to get that out. Also, with storytelling, a lot of the a lot of what you have in your resume needs to tell a story, a short story, not a long novel, but a short story. Same thing when you're interviewing, you kind of you want to tell a story, and that can help you get a government job. That video will be coming out probably on Wednesday. If you have any suggestions for me on a video topic that you think might help you, then please mention it in the chat. And if you're watching this on the replay, mention it in the comment section. I really appreciate that. Let's check the chat one more time before we leave. I hope everyone's having a great weekend, a good Sunday. I was going to barbecue today, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, oh, we got one more here. Tyler Simmons, can you hold multiple jobs at once with the federal government? This is going to depend, and it'll have to go through your human resource department. Are we talking about multiple part-time jobs? Then probably, depending. Full-time jobs? Probably not. But once you're a government employee and you're looking at getting another government job, and also with this question, are you talking about two government jobs simultaneously? Or are you talking about, I want to work at Walmart on the weekends, but I also want to hold a federal government job? If you're trying to hold two separate jobs, that shouldn't be an issue. It really shouldn't be an issue until it impacts your performance at work or if there's a conflict of interest, like you can't work at a contracting company that's supporting your agency. And then when you're not working as a contractor, you're actually working at the agency. That's going to be a no-go. All right. Um, next question. Do you think COVID hiring will pick back up in, in the federal service? Yeah. Are you talking about the urgent hire list where they were desperate to get certain healthcare professionals? Yeah, I think that will stay. That, that urgent hiring list is not going anywhere, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, that'll probably stay. Then we have a question here. Let's see. We got heads. Does feds hire vets best use for vets? That's the best place to start. Let me see if I can pull that up before I leave. Let's see if I can share that really quick. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. So you see this right here. If you're a veteran or if you know a veteran, tell them about this website, fedshirevets.gov. This explains everything that I was mentioning earlier, the hiring authorities and, and the preference, right? But the main point, the main reason I'm showing you this right now is that there's an agency directory on the upper right-hand corner right here. If you click that and you go down, these are 24 separate offices at separate agencies. You have Department of Energy, Department of Agriculture, Department of Education. And you see a guy, a person's name here, like Wayne. And you see old Bruce here from the Department of Defense or Michelle from the Department of Energy. This is an email address where you can email them your DD-214, your SF-15, 
your VA letter and your resume, and you'll tell them that you're focusing on a particular job series. I'm looking for the 0301. I'm looking for the 1700. You know, can you please consider me for upcoming positions? And there could be a job that's not even announced yet, and you could meet the criteria, and they can put you into that position. So uh, this is for non-competitive hiring authorities. Non-competitive hiring authorities do not have to be advertised. And um, they're all going to be in the accepted service and they can convert after 24 months. But this is something that you should be doing. If I were in the military about to transition right now, I would email every one of these the same message with my documents and have them keep it on file. Another thing you can do as a veteran, after you've done this, Another thing that you can do is attend the virtual hiring events. Is there are some that are specifically for veterans, and you can meet, form relationships with them, and that can give you an edge. That can make you aware of more opportunities. Okay. Yeah, see, user, that's a that's a fair comment. Um, certain agencies, like the VA, I know they'll just tell you to look at it online. But there are agencies, I believe, specifically the Department of Energy, they will keep your information on file. And when there is a job announcement that they have and they haven't publicly advertised it yet, they will consider you for it. Uh, I know somebody in the DOE who was hired in just that way. And so they first met at a virtual hiring event, but the email address was the same as what I just showed you on the, on the website. Yeah, same thing. You're, um, they tell you to use USA Jobs. <laughs> a lot of them will tell you to do that, but some of them, they'll either keep your information on file or if they're proactive, they will look for positions that they can slot you in. All right, so we've been on, going on an hour and a half now. Hey, thank you everybody so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, please click like, please share the video. And if you have any other ideas, you want to see more videos on more topics, leave a comment down below. I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you for taking the time for joining me today. Bye-bye. And that's it.